I'm Jared Fry, General Manager of Medina TV. Hi, and I'm Jacqueline Rinksmeyer, Executive Director of the Greater Medina Chamber of Commerce. The mission of the Chamber of Commerce is to serve our member investors and promote business interests through economic development, business advocacy, and member services, which benefits the Greater Medina community. The Chamber is funded by voluntary membership from the business community. It is a not-for-profit, non-partisan business organization and we do not receive tax dollars to operate the organization. The Chamber does not endorse candidates but strives to educate the voters on both the candidates and the issues. And we are pleased to partner with Medina TV to bring these interviews to you. This program would not be possible without this collaboration. So thank you to our interviewer, Jared Fry, and our producer, Matt Tomick. And as always, the views expressed in these interviews do not necessarily reflect those of Medina TV or the Greater Medina Chamber of Commerce. We thank you for tuning in to the 2022 Candidates Forum and remind you to vote on November 8th. Joining us in studio now is the incumbent for the state representative 66th district, uh, Sharon Ray. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, for the voters and the residents that may not have a chance to, to know about you, why don't you take a few seconds and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, my name is Sharon Ray and I am currently the incumbent representative of what is currently known as the 69th district, but will be the 66th district when you go to the polls for this session. I have lived in the district virtually all my life. I have been in and out of public office for the last 30 years, first getting elected as a uh, Wadsworth City Council person. I served two terms as a Medina County Commissioner. I spent five years on the Medina County Board of Election. I also served uh, a little over 10 years as a bailiff for the Wadsworth Municipal Court. And I've just been very involved in the community and, and very much enjoyed this district. Great. And, and you brought up a great point by correcting me there a little bit. Kind of explain the change of the districting and then also explain the role of what a state rep does. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about the redistricting process first because it was kind of interesting to watch play out. Uh, certainly, I don't think it played out the way that the folks who put the ballot initiative on the ballot had hoped. Uh, everything was delayed because of COVID, so they got a late start. You know, the census figures didn't come in till late. Um, there was a committee that, that was actually, it's the governor, the secretary of state, the auditor, um, the speaker of the house, the president of the senate, minority leader of the house, minority leader of the senate that met to try to bring clarity to this and as many of you who followed at home there was many many different maps proposed, uh, it ended up going to court, many many different rulings both on state and then a federal ruling so if I understand correctly they'll be back at it when we go back in the fall and they'll try to come up with maps that uh, actually will carry us through uh, the next eight cycles, uh, eight years, which is four cycles, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So at this point in time, the new map is good for only one cycle, which is a two-year period of time for the General Assembly. Uh, the General Assembly is elected for a two-year period of time. During that time, we deal with approximately $135 billion worth of budgets. We do the operating budget the odd number year, and then we do the capital budget the even number year. Uh, then also any legislation that is considered or passed during that time is uh, introduced by various legislators. It goes to one of the 22 different committees uh, that are uh, formed to have hearings and discuss different proposed legislation. I'm actually on four of those committees. I am on criminal justice, I am on um, economic and workforce development, behavioral health and recovery supports, and I'm also the vice chair of the Public Utilities Commission. Staying very busy then, aren't you? <laughs> uh, now, as far as the, the redistricting, has it changed who your constituents that you serve, uh, or is it still stay very similar to the area you've covered? Jared, we were very lucky. Our district changed very, very um, slightly. Yeah. We lost the one ward in the city of Brunswick that used to be part of the 69th because our district actually grew population-wise. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the challenge of setting up the 99 different districts around the state is they try to keep them within 5% population-wise of size. Uh, 
But you know, geographically, that changed drastically if you go from an urban area to a rural area. We have some representatives that represent two and three different counties. Mm -hmm. uh, where we are, the eastern two-thirds of Medina County, I like to think that if you just drew a diagonal line, uh, we go from Hinckley all the way down to Westfield and Lodi, all the way down to Wadsworth Township, and, and then Medina City, Wadsworth City, Seville, Lodi, Hinkley, Granger, Sharon, Medina, Montville, <laughs> Harrisville, <laughs> Westfield. Uh, so it's basically exactly the same district. Uh, so that makes it easier for you as far as uh, responding to your constituents that you served as the incumbent and now as you look to seek a, a re-election. Well, and the other benefit of that is I know the people. And that was part of what attracted me to this job in the first place, is this is all in Medina County areas I've represented before. Uh, so I know a lot of uh, the folks that are in office or new to office just by virtue of being around some of our wonderful nonprofit directors. Uh, it's, it's just, it feels like home, it feels like family. Now what would you see uh, upon re-election uh, as some of the biz biggest obstacles uh, that the state faces both on the local level and I guess maybe even on the state level? Well, you know, funding and resources is always going to be a consideration. The majority of the state of Ohio's budget goes to Medicaid, educate, and incarcerate. That's courtesy of Commissioner Hambly, formerly State Representative Hambly. So as you have smaller amounts of discretionary income, you're trying to select which programs are going to provide the greatest amount of benefit to the citizens of Ohio. You know, we've, we've dedicated an awful lot of money to economic and workforce development programs. I think you can probably see, you know, career and vocational tech has really taken off. And, and we have new needs with Intel coming in and the thousands and thousands of jobs that not only Intel is going to bring into the state of Ohio, but all the ancillary companies that go along with it. Uh, so, you know, we're going to have some changing demographics. I, I was told, and I don't have verification for this, that they're going to need 1,200 construction workers where they just don't have those people right now. And these are good paying jobs. They pay over $100,000 a year. Yeah. So it's an exciting time. Ohio is kind of on the cusp, I think, of really turning some things around. I think part of it... Uh, I heard the term generational opportunity and, and that was very intriguing. But during the pandemic when so many people learned they could actually work from home or anywhere, people migrated from the coasts back home to the hometowns. Because our quality of life here is so good, the cost of living is low, we have water, we have power, and it's kind of turned things around. And uh, when we were talking about the tax breaks the state of Ohio used to kind of um, influence and tell to pick Ohio, that was certainly not the only consideration. Somebody said to me, well, you know, we have power and water. In California, they're struggling with both of those. Yeah. Well, you touched on a couple of things there I want to expand on a little bit, and one of those was education. Uh, a lot of that is school funding, uh, trying to figure out how to handle the school funding issue in the state of Ohio and, and how it affects uh, the different schools within your area. Uh, what do you see is any possible solutions on the horizon in regards to that? Well, we did pass the Fair School Funding Act, which also it went into law. Governor DeWine signed it. It does satisfy, from what we've been told, the DeRoff decision. We haven't seen any legal renderings or opinions to the contrary, which I think was a huge gain as far as our school funding statewide. Uh, you know, we're relatively lucky here. Our schools are, are all doing such a great job. Ex not only educating, but also with the dollars that are allocated here. Uh, but we live in an area where we have good schools. You know, some of the other areas, not so much. So hopefully this bump in funding to bring them up a little more will help them get better outcomes. And then the other thing you touched on in your previous answer uh, is the workforce. Uh, and right now there's the problem of where are the workers. Uh, so what do you see as possible solutions to maybe get people back in the workforce or, or get it back to normal, I guess? Well, I think as they taper off on some of the benefits people have received from not uh, participating in the workforce, also, you know, child care, that was a major consideration during the pandemic. You know, for a while the daycare centers were closed down. People are not getting back into it as they were. Uh, they're working on some different things to open up more opportunities in those areas. Because, you know, when you have children, you can't, you know, if you have nowhere to take them, you, you really are out of opportunities and limited possibilities. Right. So I think that will also help bring people back into the workforce. Yeah. 
And uh, there seems to be a bit, of, a little bit of a political division that, that seems to be going on right now. Uh, and, and I guess, do you see that being a continuing problem? Is there a way to kind of hopefully bring people back together? Or, or what do you see uh, with that? You know, Jared, I, I, when we sat here two years ago and I first talked about this, I, I had indicated that that was something that concerned me greatly. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was first elected to city council in Wadsworth, Wadsworth is statutory, it's not charter, so there's partisan elections. It was a majority, I believe, of Democrats, and, and it really didn't matter. Everyone was so gracious and so helpful and so wonderful with each other. Um, that if I'd had a bad experience, I probably never would have done it again. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got to right the ship, and there's more work to be done. I think that for those of us that are a little more well-seasoned, it's a little easier to see past some of the passion and vigor that some of the folks that maybe don't realize that our best solutions are the ones we come up with together. And, and I will tell you, of the, the 13 bills that I have introduced this session, um, nine of the 13 bills have Democratic joint or co-sponsors. Mm -hmm. So I do work on a lot of bipartisan legislation. I was very honored to be selected by the bipartisan Partisan Ohio Association of Election Officials as their Republican Legislator of the Year. The Democratic Legislator of the Year was a representative named Bride Sweeney out of Cleveland, who is a Democrat and is just a bright, shining star. And I enjoy working with her. We're working on a bill right now to replace all the electronic poll books. You may have seen something in the news about that. The, um, the electronic poll books, when you go in to vote, are the little iPads there that you register, they take your driver's license. Well, they're seven years old now. So they're starting to fail. Uh, but that is something that benefits everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it feels good to work on those kind of things. There's uh, certainly, I think, an error of cooperation down there. We just need to build on that. Sure. We're speaking with the incumbent, uh, Sharon Ray, for the State Representative 66th District. Uh, Got to get used to the new terminology there, right? So 66th <laughs> District. Um, I, I guess what would you say or some maybe leadership skills or skill sets that might differentiate you from your opponents? Well, I, I, again, I, I think just the breadth and depth of my experience, and I have executive, legislative, and judicial experience, which has made me um, much more comfortable down there with a the variety of issues we deal with. If it was just one thing, then you could be an expert on it, but that certainly isn't the way it, uh, it happens down in Columbus. You know, the whole public utilities thing, almost half uh, of our district is public power. Well, I came from the city of Wadsworth, where it's an amp Ohio community, as a civil in Lodi, so it gives me a, a level of experience with that. Interestingly enough, the broadband, which became a major issue in this General Assembly, the expansion and making making sure people had access uh, to high-speed fiber, mm -hmm. not only from educational, but shopping, but work purposes. Um, you know, Wadsworth has their own cable system. I was on city council when we put that in, and I was a commissioner when we put in the fiber link, which is now part of the city link system as they expand out into the more rural areas to give those people an opportunity to participate in all the activities from home that most of us who have high-speed fiber mm -hmm. take for granted. Mm -hmm. And how would you say, uh, how do you handle the balance of looking out for the local constituents and at the same time also looking at the bigger picture for the state of Ohio? Uh, you know, I think the best experience for that for me was being, I was a ward city council person uh, for Wadsworth. And there are times that things that are good for your ward are bad for the city and vice versa. And I think you have to balance that. And I think the thing that we forget sometimes is that we aren't all living the same life. And some of the challenges and problems that the urban centers have are totally different from what the rural areas have. And you try Try to look at an argument, and if somebody makes a valid argument, it may not be something that's germane to our district, but if it doesn't harm us and it helps somebody else, why not? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're trying to make Ohio a better place for all of us, and there's 99 representatives, all with different districts, all with different characters, mm -hmm. characteristics, and we're all just trying to, to make sure that our district is represented as well as we can. Yeah.
Again, uh, speaking with Sharon Ray, the state representative for the 66th District. Uh, you've been so good to answer all of my questions, uh, but I want to give you the opportunity, if there's anything I missed or something you'd like to touch on, I want you to be able to speak directly to the viewers and the voters, so I will turn the mic over to you. Well, thank you so much. I do want to, I do want to say I'm very proud that we were able to pass one of the largest income tax uh, cuts in the history of the state of Ohio, which was a 3% income tax cut across the board. The current budget doubled the funding for state and local police departments. This is funding increases for training, recruitment, crime reduction, and fighting the drug cartels. We continued the strong revenue, or, uh, strong funding dedication to our recovery pursuits. And I think that this year, fingers crossed, we're going to see our first decrease in the number of overdose deaths. Um, we still have a long way to go, but it, it certainly is a step in the right direction. And also, one of my pet projects, and I'm very proud of, is that uh, we were able to bring, was able to bring home over $500,000 back to the district for the construction of emergency housing shelter. And this is kind of a project that the community has really embraced. Not only our nonprofits, but Madonna Metropolitan metropolitan housing, the commissioners, our churches, the city of Medina. Uh, it's just something that's time has come. We are the largest county in the state of Ohio that does not have an emergency housing shelter. And I am very confident that we will make that a reality in the next couple years. I think we forget sometimes because Medina is considered a wealthy community is that we have large groups of folks that uh, aren't doing as well. And we want to make sure we protect our, our vulnerable citizens as well. Uh, like I said, I, I introduced 13 bills this time. Six of them have passed the House. Uh, nine of the 13 have had bipartisan support. Uh, my first bill, my first big bill, uh, House Bill 230, is the one that overhauls the state's computer systems. As you remember, during the heat of COVID, we found out that our unemployment system was inadequate at best. We lost millions in fraud. You know, we certainly weren't the only state uh, in, in the United States that lost a lot, but it's, it's an idea that time has come. We've got to put these computers on regular replacement schedules and also uh, make sure that our cybersecurity procedures are up to date. Oh, great. <laughs> well, th thank you. Uh, definitely, it's uh, again Sharon Ray, the incumbent for the state rep representative, 66th district. And uh, I want to thank you for being part of the political process. It's always a hard thank thing you. for people to step forward and do, and you've done it for quite a while. And I uh, wish you the best of luck this November. Well, thank you, Jared. It has been an honor to represent the district in Columbus, and one I take very seriously. Thank okay. you.